Hi guys. Damn. Well, imagine that. It is another gray, gloomy, drizzly, yuck day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization and the fall of 2021. And falling we are here. It is Friday, October 8th, 2021, I believe. And uh, I have a tsunami of Airbnbers heading my way. And uh, so your old Doomer Airbnb super host has to get ready to to be charming, yes, to be charming to the normies. But before the normies arrive here uh, on this gloomy weekend, do what I try to do every Friday, and that is uh, do my ecological meltdown roundup rant, <clears throat> which is, of course, the least viewed. Uh, video of the week and probably the easiest because I simply open up my email and check in with mongabay.com with uh, Rhett Butler and the boys and girls over there at mongabay.com with their usual weekly laundry list of how we're all going to hell in a handbasket with these stories you will never see on the mainstream media. And we're going to start at the bottom of the ocean, uh, looking at deep sea mining, antithetical to science, when deep sea research meets mining interest. Wow. The high cost of studying deep sea ecosystems means that many scientists have to rely on funding and access provided by the very companies seeking to exploit the resources on the ocean floor. Yes. <clears throat> More than half of the scientists in the small, highly specialized deep sea biology community have worked with governments and mining companies to do the baseline research. Yes. But as is with as is little, 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 but as with the case of industries like tobacco and pharmaceuticals <clears throat> underwriting scientific research into their own products, the funding of deep sea research by mining companies poses an ethical hazard. Critics say the nascent industry is already far from transparent. Do you think so? Uh, and I, as they mentioned, you know, this story all over the place, and this is, uh, you know, one of the things that these conspiracy wackos latch on to, maybe uh, correctly, that, you know, when this is the fox guarding the hen house. You know, if, if you're very funding, if your paycheck, if your mortgage payment and your grocery bill is dependent on uh, somebody, you know, uh, some mining company to pay your mortgage and your groceries, are you going to be a little less objective on uh, the damage your your product or your service is doing to the planet. Uh, yes. Anyway, uh, what is going on? Yes, I love this one. This one might belong in Saturday's Hopium Roundup. For Brazil's persecuted Krenak people, justice arrives half a century later. Yes, a federal court has condemned Brazil's federal government. Uh, the state government and the country's indigenous affairs agency for human rights violations against the Krenak people committed under the military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985, and now all of this is being repeated. Yes, decades of reports 
decades of reports, witness statements, and evidence show torture, beatings, solitary confinement, and forced labor were commonplace in the Krenak Reformatory and Garani Farm, considered concentration camps by the federal public uh, ministry. Yep, and uh, just a little bit of a watered-down version of that. Uh, okay. Now, the mainstream media actually covered this one. This is Mangabe's spin on this. Extreme heat exposure in cities tripled in less than 35 years. Exposure to dangerously high temperatures in cities nearly tripled between 1983 and 2016, according to a study that considered both warming and population growth. Cities are hotter than their surrounding areas because they are densely populated and tend to generate and trap more heat. The decade starting in 2011 was the warmest in recorded history, and the proportion of the global population exposed to extreme heat is expected to multiply in the coming decades. Excessive warming of urbanized areas and the relentless influx of people points to an urgent need for policies that protect city residents, especially in developing countries. Yep, yep. Okay, here is a real sky is blue, or in upstate New York's case, sky is gray headline. Take a wild guess. What country on the planet uh, leads in forest loss this year? Mm, which country on planet Earth had more uh, deforestation than any other country? This is a real brain teaser. If your answer was Brazil, give yourself a gold star. Satellite imagery brings us a first look at this year's deforestation hotspots. Areas where forest cover was lost in high densities all across the Amazon amounting to more than 860,000 hectares, meaning over 2 million acres of the Amazon rainforest uh, hit the ground in the past year. Um, is it, I don't even know, are, are they talking about uh, the past 12 months or just, the, the, you know, going back to J January 1st, unclear here. More than 2 million acres, well, since, what is it, 70% of the Amazon rainforest is in Brazil. This is a real brain teaser. The majority of that deforestation, otherwise known as 76%, occurred in Brazil and, amazingly enough, was clustered around roads. Yes. Uh, Many of the areas deforested this year in Brazil have also burned. All right, in Colombia, <clears throat> deforestation hotspots this year were in and around, in and around numerous protected areas as well as indigenous reserves. In Peru, rice farming and a new Mennonite colony <coughs> drove recent deforestation. Um, of primary forest loss across the western Amazon between 2017 and 2020, three quarters were outside protected areas in indigenous territories. That is another way of saying 25% of these two million acres, what's that, 500,000 acres, I guess, if 75% of the deforestation was, quote, outside protected areas, that means, according to my fourth grade math, which is the last time I took a math class, 
I think that 25% of 2 million is 500,000 acres inside protected areas uh, hitting the ground. All right, here's the latest monkey you have never heard of headed into oblivion. This is the southern Patas monkey faces extinction in a decade without intervention. My guess is the southern Patas monkey will be obliterated off the face of the planet. I'm giving it five years. <clears throat> New research into the little known southern Patas monkey indicates that fewer than 200 of these primates remain on earth, all confined to protected areas in Tanzania. Yes, without intervention, researchers say the species could die out within a decade as it faces mounting pressure from habitat loss, fragmentation, hunting, and competition, meaning competition from humans for food and water. But here we go. We have a little Saturday hopium dose. Despite the grim situation, experts say that quick, well-targeted conservation actions can still save the potus monkey. Yep. Okay, I love it when they ask a question in Manga Bay. And Rhett's question of the week, <clears throat> are nature-based solutions the silver bullet for social and environmental crises. So uh, you can look for this uh, term nature-based solutions uh, showing up. This will be one of these little greeny buzzwords showing up at COP26. Uh, just let Mother Nature uh, solve the problem that humans made. Uh, so the answer to the question <clears throat> is, are nature-based solutions the silver bullet for social and environmental crises? The answer is no, for the reason there are no solutions to the social and environmental crises going on on this planet. Since there are no solutions, you know, I, I'm sure Mother Nature can do a better job uh, than humans, but we, Mother Nature has to get humans out of the way. So yes, nature-based solutions after Mother Nature has made planet Earth a, uh, a human exclusion zone, at that point, then the answer to the question becomes yes. As long as there is one human on this planet, uh, the answer to the question is no. All right, that was a real brain teaser of a pop quiz. Okay, here we go. Well, this one, uh, this one belongs in the Saturday Hopium round up tomorrow. This is more of this crap about the Half Earth Project, you know, where we give humans half the planet and every other human we share the planet with. So 10 million Earthlings, species of Earthlings get half the planet and one species of Earthling gets the other half. Yes. <clears throat> Last year, the Half Earth Project launched its national report cards, which show how much land is currently protected in each country. Yes, as if protected areas, uh, what did we just say, 500,000 acres in protected areas hit the dirt in the Amazon alone. Yes, show how much land is currently protected in each country, how many land vertebrate species each country holds, and how much and also which areas of land should be preserved to protect its biodiversity in the future. <coughs> yes. Okay, the team 
at the half earth project say the map and accompanying tools can be valuable resources for decision makers trying wait a minute trying to reach the objective of protecting 30 percent of land by 2030. I thought half of the earth was 50 percent but I guess according to the United Nations obviously my math skills so uh, I, I'm losing track so the half earth project looking uh, oh that's that 30 by 30 so you know that's where uh, I, I guess humans get 70 percent of the planet and the other 10 million earthlings get the 30 percent oh okay but they argue that the ultimate goal the ultimate goal should be protecting half of the earth there you go i think this is called the bargaining phase of the uh the five day stages of grief and denial the bargaining stage is yes. uh, critics of the program say a large number of people a large number of people could be adversely affected by such large-scale area-based protection yeah, so apparently, uh, you know, giving the other 10 million earthlings half the earth uh, is never going to fly because people, one species of earthling, need the whole damn planet. Anybody uh, thinking for one minute this crap, whether you call it 30 by 30 or half by 50, uh, you know, uh, this is greenwashing, hopium induced, apocalyptic crap. Anyway, we will have more of this kind of uh, greenwashing crap tomorrow. <clears throat> You will not believe this heading over to sub-Saharan Africa. We are going to be seeing, quote, acts of poaching and other crimes as Cameroon plans a new road inside a national park. There you go. This is, speaking of protecting, this is how we are protecting 30% of the planet uh, in the next nine years and 50% of the planet in the next 29 years. Cameroon has notified UNESCO of plans to build a new road in Lobeki National Park, part of the World Heritage part of a World Heritage listed protected area. Yes, the country's Minister of Forestry and Wildlife yes, says the road will help to secure the area against cross-border poachers and others engaged in criminal activities, but conservationists are concerned it could facilitate deforestation. Oh yes, uh, <laughs> This is called, uh, anyone who has read 1984 knows the term doublespeak. Uh, the Cameroon Minister for Forestry and Wildlife. Uh, I, I highly recommend a rereading of 1984 about the Ministry of Truth. Truth is lies. Uh, Okay, little dog, well, I know you need to pee. Alright guys, uh, this next one is, I don't have, I, I, I could do a full rant on this. Uh, this is, you know, this is the lesson that I learned with my own two eyes when I was down there uh, in the Peruvian Amazon 12 years ago, noticing 
that uh, it, it, these indigenous people, uh, and, and you know, cheering on the uh, planet eaters down there. Who do you think uh, were actually the feet on the ground in all of those gold mines? Uh, I remember the chief of one village uh, heading out uh, with his 36 inch chainsaw in his dugout canoe every day to sell logs to China. Uh, so we're gonna go over to Papua New Guinea Loss of oil palm permits leaves Papuan villagers uncertain and fearful. Some indigenous communities in West Papua, you know, call it New Guinea, who agreed, who agreed to lease their lands to palm oil companies for the promise of infrastructure development and better livelihoods have been left in limbo by a government decision to revoke the company's permits. The communities say all they want is a better life and that while they don't necessarily defend the palm oil industry, they point out that the government has done little to build roads or provide electricity for their villages. Uh, you know, this is over and over. Uh, anybody, I, I, I hate to uh, yank the carpet out from under any little delusional snowflakes listening to this. And it really does hurt me to say this, guys. Okay, I had to see it with my own eyes. Uh, and and, and uh, put yourself in the position of these Amazon Indians, uh, these guys over there in New Zealand or whatever. All right, uh, if, if you had, uh, if somebody told you uh, that you were going to go live out in, in this beautiful forest, uh, and, and we're gonna eat bugs. You were gonna you were gonna have no way to drive anywhere. Uh, you were gonna have no electricity. You were gonna have no internet. Uh, you were gonna be out there in your beautiful little paradise. You would tell them to go blank themselves. I would. You know, it's time to cut the crap on this noble savage BS. They're humans. They want roads. They want electricity. They just want a better life for them and their children. Uh, so they don't necessarily defend the palm oil industry, but if the government uh, isn't providing uh, electricity and roads and all this other internet and all this other crap, uh, they are going to roll out the red carpet to the planet eaters. So, uh, Derek Jensen, I love you, brother, but uh, th this noble savage myth has to go down the toilet. Uh, humans are humans. Anyway. Oh, boy, we have more hopium. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm no, no more hopium. Uh, here's more hopium. Jesus. Uh, all right. On islands that inspired the very theory of evolution, deforestation cuts an uneven path. This is the Wallacea region, spans Indonesia's central islands where the biota of Asia and Australasia meet, making it one of the world's most valuable centers of endemism, meaning home to scores of species found nowhere else on Earth. And guess who's there? The planet eaters with 
development pressures expected to escalate over the coming decades, identifying which of these regions' tracts of remaining forests are most at risk is key to preserving its unique biodiversity. Yes. <coughs> I assure you that everywhere on those islands in the middle of nowhere. Uh, okay, with all of the talk about the oil spill in Southern California this week, how about this one? Never heard of this till this morning. Oil spills plague the Venezuelan coast, but cleanup efforts are lacking. There have been 53 oil spills this year, meaning from January 1st to October 1st, 53 oil spills, most of them concentrated on the Caribbean coast where massive government oil refineries operate with very little environmental oversight. The Venezuelan government rarely publishes records of these oil spills or other environmental conflicts, making it difficult to track oil spills and coordinate appropriate responses. The oil spills are doing incalculable damage to local ecosystems, which include mangroves, and the estuary known as Lake Maracaibo. Lake Maracaibo, uh, it, 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 was, it was gone 50 years ago. And now, you know, so many of these oil refineries down there, they, they're just abandoned and leaking. Talking about a ticking time bomb. I was talking about that ticking time bomb over there in Yemen. If you want to see a ticking time bomb, go down there and look at uh, all of that uh, aging, derelict uh, oil refineries sitting down there along the coast of Venezuela. Uh, you, you know, you don't have to go to Yemen to find a ticking time bomb. Uh, anyway. Uh, more hopium, more hopium. Uh, now this is hopium, but I, I love the headline. Uh, before they get into the hopium, the, the only, uh, you know, this is talking about net zero carbon emissions. The, the headline sums it all up before they get into the hopium. For companies you know, usually meaning these multi-billion dollar uh, transnational corporations, for companies eyeing net zero carbon emissions, quote, no clue how to get there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I... <laughs> no clue uh, how, how to get uh, to net zero. All right, uh, moving on. You will not believe this. We were just talking about some uh, new highway being rammed through a national park in the Cameroon. I can't imagine the dots between that one and this one. Did you realize, guys, that illegal logging threatens rare Cameroonian hardwood with extinction. Ill illegal logging in Cameroon's Ibo forest threatens the African zebra wood tree with extinction. Rising demand for its beautiful wood lacks local law enforcement and civil strife have accelerated logging while hindering conservation efforts in the Cameroon. Yes, conservationists want zebra wood to be placed on a on this list of endangered species and for the forest home to endangered gorillas, chimpanzees, and red colobus monkeys to be declared a national park so they can ram a new highway through it. 
Okay, here we go. Just for, just in case you did not realize this, guys, I'm not going to get into this hopium, but I love the headline. People want to do right by nature. They just need a little nudge. Just a little nudge. Those humans, we all want to do right by nature. You know, we just need a little nudge, you know, a little nudge to get rid of our gas-sucking car, a little nudge to stop eating meat, and a little nudge to keep our, in our pants. <clears throat> anyway, moving on from that little nudge, here we go. Here is how a gendered approach to the illegal wildlife trade could engender an anti-trafficking revolution. Yes, a gendered approach. Okay, the snowflakes have taken over Manga Bay. Uh, all right, we have Sub-Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa getting tough against China. Malawi court sentences Chinese wildlife trafficking kingpin to 14 years. All right, I guess uh, Yun Wa Li heading to prison in Malawi for 14 years for masterminding an illegal wildlife trafficking cartel that operated across southern Africa. I guess he was busted in 2019 and found in possession of, wow, pangolin scales, elephant ivory, rhino horns, and hippo teeth. Hippo teeth. Uh, all right, one more, guys. I understand I am talking to myself, and I need to send out an APB to the New York Highway Patrol, apparently uh, my worker B, uh, who supposedly left his house 14 hours ago, headed here. No, he has not shown up. I have not gotten a call, a text, an email, so I need to uh, run out and contact the New York S State Patrol looking for my buddy. Uh, looks like uh, I will not be doing a uh, big cement job. But before I do that, one more, and this one in the, uh, <clears throat> this one also in the mainstream media, we're going to wind up with Manga Bay's spin. Children born in 2020, 2020 will see spike in climate disasters. A new study used climate modeling to determine specialized impacts by region, finding that at the current level of carbon reduction pledges, people born in 2020 will experience many more extreme climate events in comparison to those born in 1960. Well, I was born in late September of 1959, so I'll count myself in that one. On the world's current course, those children, you know, born last year, will experience twice as many wildfires as somebody my age overall, three times as many crop failures, and seven times as many heat waves. At a geographical scale, children born in low-income countries that are least responsible for the climate crisis will confront significantly higher spikes in extreme events than in wealthier countries. If the world takes a more aggressive approach to limiting warming to one and a half C degree rise by 2100, yes, the number of climate disasters experienced by younger generations would drop substantially. Yes, limiting global heating to less than one and a half degree by the year 2100. 
obviously uh, that one belonged in the uh, in the hopium uh, roundup, but uh, I have to wrap up the ecological roundup rant. Start contacting the state police uh, and getting ready for my uh, my deluge of Airbnbers invading bugs in a jar farm. And I highly advise you get out there and, and contact the police department of your choice for whatever reason. <clears throat> I'm going to have to do a rant about depending on the cops to save you in Mad Max someday. Bye, guys. All right, little dog, we have got to go uh, find your Uncle Alistair. I guess we're just going to have to get out there in the truck and start riding up and down uh, U.S. Uh, Interstate 86 looking for your Uncle Alistair. Bye, guys.